Um, Shane Clark says, uh, space militarization, any thoughts? Should we break the treaties or how would we work around them? Might private companies develop real military power in space? Um, and right after that, uh, there's actually three questions about militarization, so we'll take all three. Um, Timothy Morris says, assuming, I'm sorry, uh, David uh, Real, or really, says, uh, Mr. Virtual President, I'd like you to expand on your support for weaponizing space. I was asked on an edition of Hot Seat, I guess, at PJTV, uh, or maybe it was, I think it was Hot Seat. Uh, somebody said, um, how do you feel about weaponizing space? And I, I don't get to see the questions before I answer them. I said, uh, I'm in favor of weaponizing space, but I'm in favor of weaponizing everything. Um, so uh, I'll get back to that in a minute. Um, so the second part of this militarization thing says, I'd like you to expand on your support for weaponizing space. What would you put into orbit and how would you start? Just hold a press conference and say, yep, I got boom sticks in space. See, it's not a bad idea. And then finally, Timothy Morris asks, uh, assuming the country doesn't crash and burn, which military branch should be the primary weaponization or patroller of space, weaponizer or patroller of space, the Navy, Marines, the Air Force, or should we form a new branch that specializes in space combat and commercial space travel protection? Um, Okay, uh, there are uh, a number of treaties, uh, too, and I'm not up on this, and I'll tell you who is Glenn Reynolds. Instapundit is a enormously well-educated uh, about space law, but my understanding is there are, uh, there are two, two treaties and two different things we have to worry about. Um, there's a treaty, one of them is called the Outer Space Treaty. I'm not sure if I got this right. Uh, there's a treaty, and maybe it's the same treaty for all I know. But one treaty deals with the fact that space can't be weaponized, and the other treaty deals with the fact that space can't be privatized. And I think we have to abandon both of those treaties. Um, the weaponization one is, uh, you know, up until not too long ago, I would have said, uh, you know, it's a little more embarrassing, but then it suddenly dawned on me, no, why, why is it embarrassing to weaponize space? We, we weaponize uh, the surface of the Earth, we weaponize the surface of the ocean, we weaponize the atmosphere. Um, weaponizing space is, um, l l we, we carry weapons or we don't. And if we carry them personally, and if we carry them in the air, and if we carry them in, at, at sea, and if we carry them on the ground, then we might as well carry them in space because space is, in fact, the ultimate high ground. Um, space, uh, weaponization control of space means the ability to basically put uh, kinetic weapons or warheads on a target within any place in the in the world within you know 20 30 minutes um, I just think that it's unrealistic to exclude space from weaponization and people say oh we don't like the idea of having nuclear bombs in space overhead I don't think anybody I've ever heard of is talking about positioning bombs in space but frankly uh, I don't see how it's any different to have a bomb in orbit versus having a bomb in a, uh, on, on a missile in um, in the Soviet Union or Russia that can reach my house in 25 minutes. So uh, to the degree that we have intercontinental ballistic missile space is already weaponized. It's just that the weapons don't spend their lifetime in space, just spend a little bit of time in the space, but they go into space. The V-2 went into space, by the way, launched from uh, Germany and, uh, and bases in France, I guess, or maybe the Netherlands. They went straight up into space, 20, 30, 40 miles over, came down on London. Um, so since the world is a dangerous place and since I believe in this civilization and I believe in freedom and I believe in defending freedom uh, I think we ought to be in the space weapons business and and as it turns out of course we are um, the uh, the the thing that's the most disturbing about Barack Obama giving up our weapons uh, our, our defensive weapons uh, selling out the, the missile defense shield which if I was president I would fund aggressively because frankly we have been funding it aggressively for 20 years and the research has been done and now that the stuff actually works then uh, we're going to throw it away we're just going to politically choose not to use it um, I've talked with some guys uh, at Honeywell and, um, and other guys and they can tell me only so much as I've said many times I wish I had a, uh, a, a security clearance I just think it would be a, f a good thing to have and a fun thing to have um, but uh, what the guys have told me who've done some of the um, guidance work on the standard three missile which is a missile launched uh, standard missiles part of the Aegis uh, package it's a sea launch missiles launched from vertical tubes in um, cruisers and destroyers and frigates uh, and the standard three mark three um, is capable of providing an anti-missile defense and a year or two ago I talked to a guy who was working on the guidance systems of that I said you can pretty reliably hit a warhead can you 
He said, we have film that we've released uh, that shows that we can pretty reliably hit whichever part of the warhead you want us to hit. And I said, ooh, I like the sound of that. That's not something that everybody in the world can do. You know, when I was a, uh, back in the day when it was happening in real time and Ronald Reagan walked away from Iceland, um, I, uh, I remember, I'm going to do a video on uh, a firewall on why I'm never wrong. Uh, and as I said on the Stress Free Lounge, the reason I'm never long, wrong is because when I'm pointed out when I'm wrong, I move. But I was wrong a lot back in those days. I didn't think of anything. And when Ronald Reagan walked away from uh, the Reykjavik Peace Conference uh, or, or summit with, uh, with Gorbachev, with the Soviet Union, he walked out because he couldn't get uh, SDI, couldn't get Strategic Defense Initiative. The Russians wanted it off the table. Reagan wanted to keep it. I, I watched the video of Ronald Reagan looking depressed and sad and getting into the car driving away from this conference and being an idiot at the time, surrounded by other idiots uh, who'd never read Ronald Reagan, never knew anything about him. I said, oh, this old man's going to get us all killed now. Uh, this was probably the closest chance we ever had to have peace in the world, and he's walked away from it over this um, Star Wars thing, which I was in favor of because I've always been a space kid, but I said, you know, it's not going to be on the horizon for 20 years. And, and we had a peace treaty with the Russians, and, and he walked away because he wouldn't give up uh, SDI, and, and probably the missiles are on their way already. Um, so uh, what I didn't know at the time was everything. Uh, I didn't know anything about the character of the Russians. I didn't know anything about the character of aggressors. I didn't know anything about how you stop aggression. I didn't know anything about poker. I didn't know anything about uh, strategy. I didn't know anything about anything. And that's why I had. That's why I understand how it is uh, to argue with liberals, uh, because they don't have any information. That's why you can defeat them so easily, which is why they can't argue with you. That's why you got to be chucked out of the room for being a racist or a homophobe or whatever, because once you do have information, it's actually very very simple. Um, so in any event, um, so uh, in any event, what Ronald Reagan did when he walked out of that um, of that meeting was he was he was using a much 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 deeper strategy than ever occurred to me. Certainly, the news didn't portray it. But basically, what Ronald Reagan was was doing when he when he said no, we're going to keep SDI was this. He, he basically said at the height of the Cold War when he was president in the mid-'80s that the United States was spending 3 to 4 percent of our GDP on defense, and the Soviet Union was spending 26 percent of its GDP on defense. And that was unsustainable. Unsustainable. And he knew it, and the Russians knew it. They could not sustain that level of defense spending, and they were spending that kind of money to keep up with us. And so what Ronald Reagan said is a very conscious decision that he made he basically said, why are we playing in the military field against these people? Why are we playing, why are we matching our tanks and our airplanes against them? They do military well. They don't care how many people they lose. If they have 10,000 tanks and we have 300 tanks and our tanks are 50 times better than ours, they're still going to win, as, as uh, it was, I think it was Lenin who said, uh, quantity has a quality all of its own. So Ronald Reagan said, why are we fighting with these people on the military battlefield when we are so much stronger than them economically? And so what Reagan basically said was, we're going to keep SDI because we can afford this research and the Russians can't afford it. We're going to cripple them economically. We're going to, we're going to do something that's so difficult and so expensive that the Russians will simply not be able to keep up. And we will either have a, new, uh, a, a missile defense system or we'll bankrupt them trying. And that's exactly why he did it, and that's exactly what they did, and that's exactly what happened. The Russians just went out of business. So two years later, they were gone. They knew they couldn't keep up with Ronald Reagan, and they knew th from the way he handled the PATCO strike that he wasn't dicking around. This wasn't Jimmy Carter or Barack Obama. This guy meant it. He was going to build a, a, a shield against their nuclear weapons. So um, the Soviets couldn't do it. And when they realized that the Americans were going to do it, it was game over, man, game over. Right? Some, find some four-year-old girl and put her in charge. Um, so in the interim, interim years, uh, SDI, which was never was, was sold as, but it was never really, I think, feasible to stop a 25,000 warhead full-on nuclear strike. But um, it is now well within our power to, to take out individual warheads, you know, tens, dozens, scores maybe. But really, frankly, the main reason we need it is because we probably only need to take out one or two. 
uh, rogue launch by Iranians or something like that, or, or if the Chinese got a little antsy and sent 10, 15, 20 warheads our way. The kill ratio on some of these things is getting to be damn near 100 percent. And even if it's only 50 percent, even if we only have a 50 percent chance per attempt, you know, if, if each standard missile had a 50 percent kill rate and you've got an incoming nuclear warhead, launch 30 standard missiles. Try flipping a coin and getting 30 heads in a row, see what the chances of that are. Uh, we had a, a weapon uh, that was in the front of a 747. Um, laser, uh, the whole airplane was laser. The whole airplane was the chemicals to drive the laser. I've heard since then we've made incredible advances in lasers. We don't need anything like that much kind of uh, chemical stuff, but it was an airborne laser, 747, with a funny looking turret on the front, and it shot down missiles on the boost phase. You just put them in orbit. Uh, I mean, when I say in orbit, I mean a, a track. Uh, over the coast of North Korea, and when they launch their rocket, you blow it up in the sky over North Korea, and their warhead can fall down back on them. It's awesome. We can do all of this stuff. It works. We have uh, theater defense. We have, uh, you know, THAAD, the theater uh, anti-aircraft defense. We got all this stuff. The, 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 the Israelis are masters of this. Iron Dome works really well on rockets and mortars. So we have the technology, um, and we need to keep the technology. And so finally, I think the last thing I'll say on this, because uh, there's uh, so much more show to do tonight, um, uh, if I was putting money into R&D, uh, I did a defense um, segment of the virtual presidency, which, if you remember, you got on the DVD. And I said, we are, gonna in, we are going to invest heavily in um, um, revolution and military uh, af affairs te technologies. The, the gun changed warfare, uh, and energy weapons changed warfare. We need to be spending a lot of money on directed energy weapons. That means things like lasers, means things like particle beams. It also means things like electromagnetic um, kinetic weapons, rail guns. We have now uh, used uh, uh, electromagnetics to accelerate. It's just basically a steel, it's just a steel spike. And it's not even that heavy. It, it's just moving at Mach 20. Uh, and that just delivers so much energy, just so much kinetic energy, doesn't even need a warhead. In fact, that's actually good not to have a warhead because you know, you can be more precise that way. Um, so um, there's a, a program that people called Rods from God, which are basically just giant titanium rods or something, and they enter the Earth's atmosphere aerodynamically. You've got, just imagine a super, super long Estes rocket, you know, you know, just like a length of PVC pipe with a couple fins on one end, and the thing comes straight down, and because it's carrying, you know, 17,000 miles per hour of kinetic energy and a guidance system, it will penetrate anything that it hits, and then it will vaporize itself and whatever happens to be there, and you don't get fallout, you don't get a nuclear cloud, you don't get any of that stuff. So um, so space weaponization is important, and we need to be the leaders of it. And and when China says, as they said a couple weeks ago, we believe we can defeat the United States in, in, um, in battle, um, those are the kind of things that should get you woken up because uh, you have to take that threat seriously. I was a lot more confident about our ability to defeat the Chinese five years ago, not because China, China's come any further at all. It's only because of the politicization of the Defense Department. And um, the F-35, for example, which I was a big champion of until I started learning about the F-35, and once again, you know, ignorance makes you stupid. Um, uh, I mentioned last uh, episode about uh, Spray and his analysis of the F-35, and it sounds spot on to me. So uh, it's great to have uh, the best technology in the world, uh, and it's great to have carrier battle groups. But if you have a president who is not going to deploy them, then they might as well be at the bottom of the ocean. And if you're setting up your military in such a way that the guys who are training your special forces soldiers have to spend time uh, checking the tattoos of everybody in his unit to make sure that nobody is offended by them, that no one could be offended by them, instead of teaching these guys how to be hardcore killers, he's required by the uh, politically correct... Um, Progressives um, who give orders to the civilians, who give orders to the to the uh, uh, Joint Chiefs, who then pass those orders down. So if the I've heard the story from Commander Marine Bray Unit, he can't be training his guys now. He's got to dedicate time to finding out if they have Maxim magazines on base because the idea that the Special Forces operators might have uh, magazines of naked women in them, and I mean Maxim is you buy it a Seven Eleven thing. It's soft core, you know, it's not even really porn, really so much as just, you know, kind of thing you'd see at a beach anywhere. Nope, can't have that because that could offend certain members of the uh, LGBT community or certain women might be offended, and it's his job to train uh, his guys to be deadly killers and instead he has to start looking to see if they've got any magazines or whether any of his family members of his soldiers have guns at home. 
And what happens is the people who are good at fighting wars leave the military, and what's left are people who are good at being politicians. And, um, and uh, this terrifies me. It doesn't just worry me, it terrifies me. So, um, uh, you know, China, uh, China's uh, very full of themselves now, very nationalistic, very filled with national pride. I respect that and admire that. But China's going to make the same mistake that Japan made and that Germany made and that, um, and that the Confederacy, Confederacy made and that the British made, which is that we're a bunch of lazy, fat has-beens who are no longer ready, capable, or willing to fight. And um, I would just remind China, for those of those in, in the Chinese uh, leadership who are watching Stratosphere Lounge every week, as I know you do, um, we look soft and silly and, and dumb because we can afford to be soft and silly and dumb. But I would remind you that uh, the world has not seen the United States of America angry since uh, early August of 1945. That was the last time we were actually angry. And I heard a stand-up comedian, uh, I think it was an, an Asian stand-up comedian, American-Asian, Asian-American stand-up comedian, or, or some, maybe it was a, a, somebody from overseas, but he said, you don't want to get into war with the United States of America because when America gets really, really mad at you, they're not going to send a thousand bombs. They're going to send two bombs. Um, so, um, space weapons, uh, let me just give you one more quick little thing here. Um, space weapons, uh, we're talking about, uh, right now we're talking about Earth orbit. Uh, the thing that's really fascinating about space weapons is what will space weapons look like uh, when you're talking about space combat. Do we have a space combat question coming up here? No. So let's do it now. Um, this, this, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm tempted to do a third part, which is just space combat. You know what? I'm going to. I'm going to do a third part because I'm having so much fun here, and um, we're already an hour and 20 into it. I have five other questions. Space combat is a thing all its own. The science, it, it's kind of a science fiction space show. So why don't we do, um, why don't we do part three on space combat? Uh, because I, I could do an hour on that. The whole idea of stealth in space, I don't believe in stealth in space. Some people swear by it. I just don't see it. Um, I will tell you that, um, just as a tease, um, uh, uh, one of the Tiemann's brothers, and I have to respond to them because they, they pay me so much money, uh, said America wasn't really angry in 2003. No, it really wasn't, Zechariah. We weren't angry in 2003, 2001. If we were really angry, there'd been a mushroom cloud over Mecca. Um, so anyway, um, and apparently it was Carlos Mencia who said that. I'm, I'm never quoted him again. I never will. I'm sorry it was Mencia because it was actually great line in any event um, back to this idea of, of, of ship to ship combat in outer space uh, many people who speculated about it have given the impression that it would be a lot like submarine combat um, and in the traveler universe uh, tra they, had a, they had a great it wasn't as much fun to play but there was a traveler supplement called 2300 wasn't even a supplement. The game evolved into 2300, and it became much, much, much more realistic, much more present. You know, the Traveler Imperium was thousands of years in the future, um, but Traveler 2300 was um, set in 2300, and so the weapons were considerably more sophisticated, and they they treated they treated the space combat system as a targeting problem, um, and that is. Uh, that is the way a lot of people talk about space. So just as a tease, because uh, we could do an, easily do an hour and a half on this, um, when we say a targeting problem, you have really two issues in, in, in warfare. You have um, to detect the target, and then you have to destroy the target. In combat on ground, for most of the history of humanity, detecting the target is not a problem. There stands the line of cavemen up on the ridge, the hairy ridge people who live in the mountains. There they are. Uh, there's Napoleon's army. There's um, a tank concentration. There's this. Now we know where they are. Now we have to fire enough musket rounds at them. <clears throat> and the destruction, will uh, we are definitely going to do a special, a special space episode. The destruction then becomes in, in, into two phases. Is it better to hit them with uh, volume of fire or with accuracy of fire? In other words, do we shoot a lot of musket balls at them and try to hit them that way? Or are we a galleon that shoots a broadside that launches 300 cannonballs? Because if you look at, ga if you look at naval vessels, Naval vessels went from 300 cannons on a galleon three, 400 years ago, now up to 15 guns on a, 16 guns on a battleship. They got more accurate, so you needed fewer of them. Now there's one gun. Um, 
you know, a rail gun or the gun is a missile. There's, so as we get more accurate, we can reduce the volume. We'll get to that. Um, but anyway, 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 so the question is, what is space combat going to be, lo be like? And a lot of people think it's going to be like sub-combat. Sub-combat is not like traditional combat, where you just find the enemy and start blasting him with your weapons. Sub-combat has been described best, and I think this is exactly right, as hide-and-seek with bazookas. And what that means is the first, the first person who knows where the other person is is going to win because a torpedo, one torpedo impacting a submarine is the end of the, it's the, end of the fight. Submarines don't survive multiple torpedo impacts. So everything in sub-combat is detection. You have to be quiet. You have to be stealthy. You have to listen to where the other guy is. You can't use your active sensors unless you really are desperate because the second you ping uh, and send out a, a, a sonar pulse to find where this other guy is, every submarine within a 400, 500-mile radius is going to know where you are because you just made a big, loud noise. So um, sub-combat is, is hide-and-seek with bazookas. You hide and hide and hide. When you find out where the guy is, you launch a bazooka at him, which means you don't have to hit him but once. That's why it's a bazooka. You don't have to put 50 rounds of bazookas into a guy. You hit a guy with a bazooka one time, that's pretty much it. So um, hide-and-seek with bazookas. And they've tried to make space combat into that, and I just don't think it will be. And the reason I don't think it will be is because I think the sensors are so good. In the ocean, you can hide in the ocean, and there's this layer of water called the thermocline where below which the water changes temperature and changes density and uh, sound on one side of the thermocline doesn't cross so if you've got a surface vehicle and a submarine goes deep enough it gets below this um, this salinity level and um, the sub is suddenly on a different planet just disappears um, but we have such sophisticated sensors now that we can detect we can detect um, objects that are just a half a degree above absolute zero. And life support is much, much more than uh, zero Kelvin. And uh, even if you were to cool the exhaust of, 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 of a rocket, it's all very hot. So because, because the vehicles, the power plant and the, and the thrust and the life support, because all these things are very, very hot compared to how cold space is, I think our sensors are we're, we're going to know where everybody is. So instead of it being hide-and-seek with bazookas, it's going to be a bunch of guys on an infinitely large playing field surrounded by sirens and bells, and everybody's going to know where everybody is. Then it's going to be range and maneuver. It's going to be range and maneuver, in my opinion. Uh, who's got the most delta-V? Who's got the longest range weapons? Who's got the most fatal weapons? Combination of this in um, movie two of Aurora, where we have actual space combat with the Chinese. Um, we make a decision and they make a decision. The Chinese have a bigger lead time, so they go with energy weapons, which have much longer range but less damage. And our guys are more like a, uh, like a brawler that has to get in underneath the reach of a guy who's, you know, a boxer. We've got much more deadly weapons, but they have a much shorter range. We've got to get in close, so it's interesting. So we'll deal with that. Anyway, uh, that's a whole episode and a fun episode, so we'll make that part three, Space Combat. will be groovy. We'll take some more questions for that, too.